From fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Pod Therapy. Real people, real problems, and real therapists. You can submit your questions anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. Sorry to all you Germaniacs, this is a Nick only episode. Today on the show, I interview Junior Rodriguez about living a life in recovery from drug addiction. You are not going to want to miss this. And now, broadcasting from beautiful Las Vegas, I'm Nick Tangeman. It's time for some pod therapy. All right. So, uh, I am very excited for today's bonus episode. This is going to be awesome. You guys are really going to like this. Today on the pod, I'm interviewing a friend and former coworker, Junior Rodriguez. This guy has an amazing story. Uh, we talk about his battle with drug addiction and homelessness and how he is able to turn his life around and transform into the person he is today. He is currently working in a drug rehab as a supervisor of line staff, um, kind of the guy that's in the trenches with the clients every day, and he supervises all of the staff that are in the trenches with the clients every day. So uh, he is a very busy guy. Uh, personally, I find his story very inspirational. I know Jim feels the same way. Uh, I think you Therapals will really enjoy this. And now here's my episode with uh, Junior Rodriguez. All right. So we are here with Junior. Junior, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, for the listener, you and I kind of go back a little bit as well as Jim. Yeah. We have worked at three places together. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to name those because I always keep that off the podcast. I don't want anybody knowing where I've worked. But um, we worked at one place together, and then I left. And we worked at the second place together for a little bit, then I left. Uh, I think you worked there with Jim for a lot longer than I worked with you Yeah, at the second location. And I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, – when Jim was trying to convince me to come on and take the clinical director's job at the last place that we worked, one of the selling points was, I got Junior. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was really excited to tell me that. He's like, hey, I got Junior. Oh, man, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and it was actually a good selling point because uh, you, you kind of have the reputation in Las Vegas. You're kind of, we jokingly refer to you as, uh, the mayor of recovery, uh, <laughs> because you kind of, you, you've been around, you're very active in the recovery community, but then also working for a treatment program and working in the rehab, um, you're very passionate about what you do. Yeah. Where does that passion come from? I couldn't even start to tell you where it comes from. Man. I, I'm serious. Um, it comes from the heart. To begin with, it comes from the heart. And thinking back from where I came from, um, the hard life I lived, um, being involved in gangs, being going to prison, and then to see myself today doing what I'm doing, that's a miracle, man. That's right. a huge miracle for me to be able to be doing what I'm doing today. And it's like, it's a fire inside of me that I can't even control it. It just comes out. It's just, I, you know, and people always tell me, when you do groups and when you do this and when you speak <laughs> and when you share, you're animated. You're just not like a normal person. Like the normal person that speaks and stuff, you know, I pace back and forth. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, uh, I get animated, I'll get pens and books and papers and I'll act stuff out, you know, and, and what I'm trying to show the people that are, in re that are in recovery or trying to get in recovery or walking in as a newcomer, what I'm trying to show them is that if I did it, you can do it too. And what I do is I, I show them where I came from for they can relate. Right. I show them exactly where I came from and they're like, oh my God, you were there? And how I was thinking when those things were happening at that time. And they're like, oh, my God, that's exactly the way that I think. Right? Yeah. It's the same way that I think right now. And then um, I tell them, like, I wasn't perfect when I first walked in. I made mistakes. But, but somewhere in that path, in my journey, I started to see something different. And people started talking to me and telling me. And, and I started to say, you know what? I need to do something different. And when right. I did something different other things started to change in my life. People started to trust me, you know, um, 
uh, I, I stopped robbing people, so now it's like, it's like a boomerang. What you do in the bad world, it comes around, right? right? What goes around comes around, and I started to do the good things, and the good things started to come back, and it felt good. Yeah. And it felt good, you know? And, you know, one of the things that you brought up that's really interesting, and I want to highlight this, is that uh, in every rehab that I've worked, there's always a mixture, and I think this is a good thing, there's a mixture of folks like me who went to school and, you know, are, are the therapist, and you who've had the real-life experiences. And it's really important to have that mixture because you can learn the stuff that I do. I can't learn the stuff that you do. Right. Right? So having that mixture, there's, uh, you know, we have a, a lot of folks, a lot of clients that um, I could have a really good, impactful individual session with, I can do a really good group with, but there's always just that one little piece that I'll never be able to have, which is that, hey, I've been there too, and here's how I did it. And that has been very it's necessary. You have to have people like that in your rehab who can actually sit down and, and do that because there's so many of these folks that don't have any hope. Like it's the, uh, I think a lot of people who don't understand addiction look at those individuals and they think that like, don't they just want something better? And our answer to that is of course they do, but they don't believe that they can have it. It's not that they don't like, like they want to live this way. Is that they don't believe they can live any other way. And I think, uh, kind of going back to one of the things that you said about your passion, this is one thing that, uh, <laughs> so at the last place that we worked, uh, the group room was just down the hall from my office and Jim's office. Yeah. And I remember one day we were sitting in Jim's office and, uh, and you were doing group and we could always hear you. Because you're you're in there and you're like like a preacher, like you're getting into it and you're and we can hear everything you're saying and it's just very passionate and very aggressive and and loud and uh, and I remember saying to Jim, I said, you know, the really cool thing about Junior is that he could have twenty people in that group or he could have just one person in there and it's going to sound exactly the same. Yeah, and there was a day. That I walked by, and there was only one person in group, and it sounded exactly the same. <laughs> so, so can you give us a little background? Like, how did you uh, how did you get involved in the drug life? How did you how did that all start for you? The way it happened with me is my mom came from Cuba, and she came pregnant, and she was trying to give me a better life, mm -hmm. right? And Cuba's real poor, and she didn't want me to suffer, you know, the Cuban life. Right. So she came to the United States. Now, I was an only child. And when I came to the United States and she had me and everything, um, I started, my mom had to go to work, you know? Right. My mom had to pay the bills, so she had to go to work. And me as a kid, I didn't have brothers and sisters that I can play in the house, that can babysit mm -hmm. me. So I would sit at the house, you know, um, and uh, I would look out the windows and see the kids outside playing. I would ask my mom or call her at work, and I go outside and play. And I started at a young age going outside. Now, I grew up in Los Angeles, California, right. in the worst part of L.A., and I didn't know what I was getting myself into when I started. I started with the kids around the neighborhood, stealing candy bars and candies and playing and, and getting into the video games and, and stuff like that. And then one time I was introduced for, to a little bit of weed. And, and I was like, and once you cross that line, mm -hmm. you know, you're like, that's not that bad what they say it's, it is, you know? Like, oh my God, if you do weed, the, you know, the world's gonna end. <laughs> and I was like, I, I did a little bit of weed, I smoked a little bit of weed, and it was like, this ain't that bad, this kind of <laughs> feels pretty good. And at the beginning, like any other addict, when you first begin, it's fun, it's the giggles, it's the munchies and stuff like that. Everything is cool, but it just, it, 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 you start hanging out with the wrong crowd and it escalates to the next drug and the next drug and the next drug. And for me, that's what happened. It started escalating into the next drug, the next drug. How old were you at this time? The first time I smoked weed, I was 12 years old. Wow. I was 12 years old and, um, and then I started to do a little bit of coke and then lace it and then and then PCP, and then it was just one after the other, after the other, after the other. And um, I started going to jail, right? Yeah. I started going to jail. And at the, fir the first time I went to jail, it was scary, 
right? It was scary, and um, um, but I was trying to make a name for myself, right, around the neighborhood. Right. I was trying to make a name for myself and um, and show people that I wasn't scared. But in, it, deep, deep inside, I was scared. You sure. Know? And um, and I got picked on, and I, I was always fighting. I didn't know how to fight. They didn't. They didn't. I, I didn't have a dad to teach me how to fight or anything like that. So I learned how to fight because I was always getting my butt kicked. So I was always fighting and fighting and fighting. So I ended up learning how to fight. Right. So I ended up going to prison. I mean, to jail, in and out, in and out, and I got used to it. It was no big thing. And then I ended up at the age of eighteen. I ended up going to prison, and then uh, my my disease was just full blown. Right? It right. was just full blown. I was smoking crack, and if you didn't have crack, I do speed, and if I, d I didn't have speed, I do PCP, and it just went on and on and on. Was this a daily habit at this point? Every day, yeah. every day, I, nonstop. Every day, I, I wouldn't stop. I had to have something. It didn't matter what it was. I was like a human trash can. Whatever you gave <laughs> me, I took. Right? right. So I couldn't see what was wrong with me. I thought it was. I have a drug problem. I didn't understand that I had a me problem, right? Right. I had a me problem. I, I couldn't grab that. I didn't understand that, right? I kept going in and out of prison, and um, and I, and it's so funny because the last time when I was eight, when I was about twenty one or twenty two, uh, I was I got married, and my wife told me, uh, "Let's move to Vegas because you being in in L A." You're going to be involved with your homeboys and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? You're right. Maybe if I move to Vegas, I'll be all right. Because I don't have my group over here, right? right? I went to Vegas and I stood out here for like about six months. I had a little job and stuff. And before you know it, I got bored. And when some, when an addict gets bored, they don't go, you know, to church or somewhere <laughs> to go look for friends. You go for what you know. And that's right. what I did. I went where... The homeboys and stuff. The faces changed, but they were doing the same thing. And I clinged right into that. And before you know it, I took off like a rocket. Little did I know that when I left Los Angeles and I came to Vegas, and it doesn't matter where you go, I thought I left my disease behind me. But my right. disease jumped in the suitcase with me <laughs> and came with me right. because I did not leave myself behind. Yeah. I had to bring me with me, right? Yeah. So, That's why the whole geographical cure doesn't doesn't work. No, absolutely yeah. not. It does not work. Everybody mm -hmm. thinks, oh, if I move or if I'm not around it, but it's everywhere. Right. So what do you think is the problem? See, I didn't understand that at that right. time, right? I didn't get that. Yeah. Where they say, oh, you know what? If you move and you're not hanging out with the gang members and the drugs and this, you'll be all right. And that's what I thought. That's what I believed, right? So then... um. I came to Vegas and I didn't, I couldn't find the drugs that I was using in LA, so I jumped into another drug, which I started to use meth, and I started, you know, doing all the same stuff that I was doing there. I was doing over here. I created like a, my own support group out here. I wasn't from no gangs out here, yeah. but I brought all the knowledge that I had from over there. I brought it over here, and it was like I still couldn't see it. Yeah, my mom prayed for me. I had been to prison. At the age of like 32, I had been to prison eight times already. Wow. In and out, in and out, violating, you know, violating and, and new commitments. And, and I had to go back because I couldn't stay clean, right? And my mom would tell me, what's wrong with you? You know, and I didn't have, you know, my mom didn't have insurance to put me in a rehab. I didn't right. even know that there was rehabs that you can go to and stuff. But but, but one thing that when I was, when I was, um, when I was locked up, they give you day for day. And uh, day for day means that they take a day off the front end of your sentence and a day off the back of your sentence. And the way that they do that, if you're going to school or you're working or you're going to some program. So when I was in prison, I used to go to Narcotics Anonymous. Narcotics okay. Anonymous, H&I, &I, used to go in there and get my little paper signed and stuff. So I couldn't tell you what they would share about. But the day that I was ready to get clean, I could remember that name, Narcotics Anonymous. I remembered that, right? That's And that's important because I, what I'm kind of hearing you say, and I've always taken the same philosophy in working with adolescents, is that I, I try to focus on 
not winning the battle, but winning the war. You know, I realized that a lot of the kids that I worked with at the adolescent program that I was working for probably left there and went right back out to using. But I planted the seed, you know, and I tried to make the experience uh, somewhat enjoyable so that when it came around to, okay, now I need really need help, they're more likely to get back into treatment. Sounds like kind of something similar happened with you with the NA. You know, you had that little bit of exposure. It was something familiar to you. Mm -hmm. So did that make it more comfortable for you later on in life to get back into that program? No. Oh. (laughs) It didn't. It didn't. But like you just said, the seed was planted. Right. Right? That seed was planted. And you're absolutely right. I didn't know anything about Narcotics Anonymous. I just knew, and I remembered that they say, if you put a dollar in the basket, you're all right. And even if you don't have a dollar, you can still go to the meetings, right? Yeah. So I was, I was, I moved from Vegas to Florida. And when I moved from Vegas to Florida, I did the same thing. I stood clean for a little bit. I got bored. I started looking for people, you know, uh, uh, doing the sign, you know, you lift your head and they, they, they mm-hmm. say, yeah, and then you walk over there and you tell them you got a little bit of money, you know, that's, that's what we do. Before you knew it, I had a little, I had a little, a, a little circle of people that I would go get my stuff from and before you knew it, I knew a whole bunch of people. Yeah. Um, my family told me, we don't want you home. We don't want you here no more. If you're going to be doing that, you got to go stay on your own. And so I thought I was macho man and I said, you know what, I don't need you guys. I'll go live on the street, and I and I went homeless, and wow. uh, I was living under the bridge, eating out of trash cans. And when I when I say eating out of trash cans, I wasn't picking up like the stuff that other people ate. What I would do is I would go and sit behind Wendy's, and when they would pick up the food, the breakfast, and throw it away, they it's all the food that's in there, right? That was on the grill. They pick it up, put it in a bag, and dump it. I already knew which one it was. I wasn't biting other people's burritos or nothing like that, right? That's what everybody thinks. And I'd go fill up my soda, and I'd go under the bridge, and I'd go eat, right? And I still thought I was all right. I literally... Even even then, even homeless, you still thought... I I thought I was all right. Could you believe that? You know, and it was like, you know, um, I kept smoking crack, and I kept smoking crack, and... I remember um, I went to jail in Florida one time. I didn't go to jail a lot in Florida. I just went one time, and it was for some kind of a ticket, and I got out. And um, I I went back to the neighborhood that I was using dope at, and um, it was hot, so I went out of that neighborhood to another neighborhood that I knew. And what happened was um, I was so tired because I was up for so long, and um, I was in this loop-de-loop, and they kicked me off of the loop-de-loop train because I was sleeping on it. Oh. And then once I got kicked out of that train, I was sitting against a pillar and I fell asleep. I said, I'm gonna sit right here and just take a rest. And a little spider, a brown recluse came and bit my hand right here. And I hope you got, I wish I could show it to you guys, but I can't, <laughs> right? But uh, I got bit and it was a li- like right a little- Right on the palm of your hand. Yeah, it was, it was a, a it looked like a, bl- like a little, pimple right okay and I didn't pay much attention but it hurt and it started to get bigger and bigger and bigger and I didn't know what it was I thought it was a mosquito because there's a lot of mosquitoes out in Florida right. I thought it was a mosquito that bit me and I was like oh let me go keep smoking it'll take the, the pain away it got bigger and bigger and bigger before you knew it my fever was 107 and I couldn't take it anymore wow. and I went to a fire station and uh, I told him I don't feel good and it's the different and it's a trip because I could tell the difference when I was sick and when I was dope sick, and that day I felt sick, something wasn't right. right. They took me to the hospital, I, I stood, they did surgery on me, 16 days, I stood in the hospital. After the 16 days, I, um, uh, I got out, and guess what I did? Right back to using? I went right back to using. Yeah. It didn't stop me. But that day I tried to take a hit of crack, and my hustle was I would go panhandle or steal or whatever it was, but I had a skin graft on my leg that they put on my hand and I couldn't walk and I couldn't use my hand because my hand was in a splint. Oh. And it was early in the morning and I looked up, I was at a park, I had just taken my last hit and then I looked up in the sky and I said, 
God, is this the way I'm supposed to die? Is this the wow. way I'm supposed to die? And a little voice said, why don't you just go home? I got up and I went home. And I told my mom, I said, you know what? I, I know that I've told you this a thousand times that I'm going to stop. And I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm done. I'm tired. This is not fun anymore. This is a job. Yeah. You know? And uh, she took me in and she watched me because I was notorious to go in, uh, eat, take a shower and be gone. And this time I ate, took a shower and I went to sleep and I stood there. But when I woke up, I told my, I told my, uh, my mom and my dad, you know, I need help. I don't know where to go. But I remember when I was in prison, this place they call Narcotics Anonymous. And I looked on the yellow pages and I found it and I called their hotline. And I told my dad, I know you're not going to lend me the car. Can you give me a ride to the meeting? And when I walked into that meeting and I, I stood in the back of the room and I, I looked around and I said, these people aren't like me. They're not like yeah. me. You know, they don't come from the lifestyle I come. But I started to hear the stories they were talking about. And I was like, I can't believe that these people are sharing their stories. How can they share all the bad things that they did? You know, like, I'm yeah. not going to tell nobody what I did. Are you crazy? You know, I don't know if there's some a cop in here or something, you know. I don't know that. Right. But I stood there because something right here in my heart, it felt different. And something said, stay. And I went to the meeting. And I stood. And the next day I said to my dad, you know, I was still drinking, but I wasn't smoking crack. And I never picked up a white chip. I never went up to mm -hmm. pick up a white chip. So the white chip is the newcomer. The newcomer chip. Right. And I didn't pick it up, right? Because they kept saying in the meeting, alcohol is a drug. Right. Alcohol is a drug. Alcohol is a drug. And it kept ringing in my head. And I was like, and uh, I would go home and I'd tell my dad, take me to the meeting. Now, my, my dad was okay that I would drink as long as I wasn't using the hard drugs. I'd drink a beer and stuff right. and go into my room. And I told him one day, take me, take me to the meeting. And he's like, you're not going to drink your beer? And I said, you know what? Not today. Mm. Not today. And uh, um, when I came back from the meeting, I drank a beer, you know. But I didn't drink it when I, you know. And I right. thought that nobody in the meeting knew that I was drinking. And uh, now I go to meetings and I see people. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you're drinking. You're doing heroin. You're smoking weed, right? So people knew, right? Sure. People knew that that was what was going on. And I said to myself, the day after my, the day after my birthday, I'm going to stop and I'm going to pick up that white chip. But I couldn't stop. And I went two more days. So my clean date, my birthday is 10-8-69. Uh, I got clean 10-10-03. Uh -huh. So I got clean two days after my birthday. Now I got 15 years clean. 15 years. Yeah. That's amazing. And it's still it still amazes me because I'm trying to think of something that I've done for 15 years consistently. And I've got nothing. <laughs> like, I honestly, I can't think other than waking up and eating. I can't think of anything that I've done for 15 years consecutively. Neither can I. <laughs> That's all I got. That's all I got. And I'm not willing to lose it for anything or anybody. Wow. You know? And um, it was hard. It was hard trying to get back into life, trying to get a job. I did not graduate from high school. I did not go to college. Mm -hmm. So when you when we were working together, Nick, and 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 you were showing me all that, I, I used to cling on to you like a leech. You didn't know that. Because <laughs> I wasn't making it noticeable. But when we used to work together and any kind of things, any kind of knowledge you gave me, you were like my teacher. You were my Yoda. <laughs> Believe it or not, you were my Yoda wow. and I was I was listening. Because you went to school and I heard your stories and stuff. And one of the things that I did is that when I was, when I was, um, when I was out there using and, and, and doing the, the gang life, I always followed the leader. Right. I always followed the person that knew the most. I wasn't following. I wasn't following the one that didn't know. I followed the, because I wanted to be just like them. So the way that I could only be like them is by following the person that knew the most. Right. right. So I said, you know what? The knowledge that I learned in the street, I'm going to transform it and use it in my recovery. Yes. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I'm going to use it in my recovery. 
And and that makes a lot of sense. And we've, I mean, we've done groups together. And I remember we've even talked about that with some of the clients that were in groups. Is like, you know, when you're actively involved in your addiction, you learn survival skills. Like you learn a lot of useful skills that, if applied in a positive way, I mean, addicts and alcoholics, in my opinion, are the most resourceful people I've ever met. Because if they need to get their drug, they'll find a way. Like, there's no obstacle that's going to stop them from getting it, mm-hmm. you know? And if you can take that same uh, energy, that same mentality, and, uh, and just substitute that substance for recovery, you know, it's like, well, I, I, I need my recovery, you know, but I can't get it because this obstacle's in the way, well, then move around it, work through it, find a way through that obstacle. You would have done it for your drug. I remember hearing you say that several times in group. Like, you know, would that have stopped you from getting high? Mm-hmm. No, then it shouldn't stop you from getting clean. Yep, absolutely. So. Where there's a will, there's a way, man. All right. And um, I, came, I came to Vegas. I came back. I got clean, and I had five years, Right. I got clean and I had five years, but I still had a tail because I was running from the law here in Vegas. Oh. I was on parole and I was running from the law. So I had five years clean and I called Vegas and I said, hey, I've been clean for five years. Do you think that I could get put back on probation and parole and and finish my sentence? And, you know, because I was like, man, if I've been clean for five years, I could do this, right? right? So I called them up and they said, you know what? You're the guy that's in Florida that we haven't got when to go get. Right? And you've been clean for five years. I'm looking at your record. You don't have anything. We're just going to give you a dishonorable discharge. And I was like, what? You're giving me a who? I said, could you send me a letter telling me that you're, you know? And uh, they sent me a letter. And I was like, oh, man, I could go back to Vegas. And I moved back to Vegas because my kids were here. Oh, okay. Because in all this and all, in, in all this that was going on, I had, I, had, I, my, I had kids with my wife. Right. And um, I said, you know what? I'm going to come back to Vegas. You know, I had gotten with, with another with another girl. I had kids with her too. So I had four kids that were living out here. And I was like, my mom had just passed away. My mom passed away in 2010. And I said, you know what? I told my dad, are you coming back to Vegas or are you staying over here? And he's like, no, I'm going to stay here. And I'm like, I'm going to go back with my kids. I got to make an amends with my, family, my kids. Right. Right. I got to see how I'm going to do this. And, um... So I came back and it was hard for me to get a job because I didn't have anything. I didn't have any kind of knowledge. The only thing that I knew how to do was irrigation. I learned how to do irrigation in Florida. But when you come to Vegas, there's no plants out here. Right. It's a bunch <laughs> of rocks and you can't water rocks. <laughs> you know, they're not going to pay you for that. So it was really hard for me to do that. Out there, I was a foreman and I ran a crew and everything. I, I escalated myself to do that. Yeah. And then when I came here, I was like, okay, now what am I going to do? And I was, and you're not going to believe this, but I was watching auction hunters. <laughs> okay. And I said, I could do that. If I can sell dope, I could sell merchandise. All right. right? So I went to a couple of auctions and stuff, and I started to try to um, buy stuff and sell it. And, and I started off with $200. You know, and um, I kept looking at different auctions and just the same way, like I said, what I did in my disease, I started to do in my recovery. I said, you know what, I'm going to find different places to buy stuff and auctions and yard sales and stuff and flip it. If I could flip dope, I can flip merchandise and be honest about it. I'm not stealing it. Right. It's all in, it's being honest. And I did that. Before you knew it, I was going to these auctions and I was buying huge amount of stuff. I had a tra- a 17 foot trailer and I was making in two days like $1,500 off of yard sales, believe wow. it or not. Well, one day I got hit for operating a business without a business license because oh. I had so much. I had refrigerators, beds out there. <laughs> so I had I had all kinds of stuff. I would I'd get a couple of guys to come help me. And my, I, I had gotten married again, and my, and my wife said, you know what, I'm going to go work in treatment. And I'm like, you go work in treatment, I'm going to continue doing this, because what I want to do is I want to I do it like Salvation Army. I want to open up like a, a, a sober living and put them to work with what I do here like this. 
But it didn't work out like that. My ex-wife started to work for this company, the company that, that you used right. to work for. And she said, you know what? You would do good working in treatment. I'm like, they're not going to hire me in treatment. <laughs> Are you crazy? And I'm like, and she said, try it. What do you got to lose? So she filled out my application. I didn't even <laughs> fill it out. She filled out my application and turned it in. And one day I'm sitting at the house and my phone rings and they're like, you got an interview to come interview here. And I'm like, what am I going to say? So my whole interview was about my recovery. Yeah. And that guy told me, and he must have seen the passion. Yeah. And he, he hired me. And when I went in there, I, you know, I, I, my OCD kicked in and I started organizing <laughs> stuff and fixing stuff. And, you know, and um, I got let go after a while. I got let go and they told me that it was a budget cut. Mm-hmm. Um, if it was a budget cut or whatever it was, but I had a resentment. Yeah. And I said to myself, I'm never going to work in treatment again. I was really, I, I held a resentment and, uh, and, um, but that's not, that wasn't God's plan. God right. wanted to use me for something. I don't know what it is, but, um, I said, uh, I'm not going to work in treatment. And I kind of held the resentment for a while. And then I said, you know what? I've worked here. Let me try. And I put an application somewhere, another company. And they hired me, but it was part time. And I tried to escalate, yeah. but they people kept crossing me, and I couldn't get full time. And then I went to the next company, where that's the company that you were working at, but you were working in the outer skirts of it. Yeah. And I started escalating in that part, and then they switched me over to that to the other program that we were all together, me, you, and Joven, yeah, and Jim. And um, and. Uh, I learned a lot. I was learning from you when you would go there the little bit, because I, I wouldn't stay with you that long. Right. But I was learning from Jim, because Jim's smart, man. He knows a lot. <laughs> yeah, so I... I, I don't clean. tell him that, all right? I, I won't. <laughs> don't hear this he recording, does, Jim. He doesn't, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't need that. Yeah. <laughs> so I learned a lot from Jim, and he had a lot of... That he would sit down with me, and he would say, you know, try this, and do this. Yeah. And he would have long talks with me, Right. And I was just sucking it up like a sponge, right? Yeah. And uh, and I would and I would come to Jim and I would say, I got this idea, right? I got this idea. What can I do it, boss? And he said, Try it. And I would do it, and it would work. And I would come back, and you know, th- I would find problems, but I'm not the per- person to find a problem and say, What do you want me to do, boss? I would find a right. problem and come with three solutions with it. Can I use one of these? And he would say, Yeah, try this one. And, and he liked that about me, that I would say, look, there's this problem, this problem, this problem, but I got this solution, this solution, this solution, this solution. Handle it. Do it. Go for it. Yeah. And I kept doing that, right? And, and which, which, by the way, is every supervisor's dream. Yeah. To have somebody like that. Where, and, and it was always like that when we worked together, too, where I, you never came in and, like, ugh, threw, throw your hands up, like, I don't know what to do. It was always... Here's what we've got. Here's my idea. What do you think? Which is great because then we can we can brainstorm. You know, I can say like I love this part of it, but maybe we need to change this part. Or we can say, I don't know. Let's try it. You know, let's just see what happens. But it it makes a supervisor's job so easy mm-hmm. when you have that 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 mind frame. Plus, I think it helps you as well because it kind of trains you to be solution focused. And instead of looking at everything that's wrong in the world, you see things that you don't like and, and your brain automatically goes to, but here's what I can do about it. Here are some ideas that I've got, which I think is very helpful, very therapeutic. Absolutely. And, uh, that you know, it came to the point that I felt that at that program, I was just hitting a, a glass ceiling and I couldn't grow and I wanted to be a leader of a team. Yeah. You know, and I told, I was asked to share at this other company, and I thought I was sharing to the clients. And I was sharing, me, my sponsor, and my sponsee brother were speaking to the admin. Oh. To the directors and nurses and sharing our experience, strength, and hope on what we knew, right? And I'm looking around, and I'm telling my sponsee brother, this is a nice place. (laughs) I go, you know what? They're starting off, and I'm like, man, if I start off with, my head was going, if I start off with a company that's coming off the floor, I could bring ideas to the table. Mm -hmm. I could be somebody here, right? 
And I was like, you know what? I'm going to try it. What do I got to lose? What, right. what, what, what are they going to say? No? Yeah. Okay, I'll turn back and go right back to where I was at. And I slid my resume over there, and they called me, and I interviewed, and they, and they hired me. And I went back to Jim, and I said, Jim, sorry, man. And you broke Jim's heart. And, I, and he's like, are you serious? What do I got to do to keep you? And I'm like, man. I, and he, and he, I mean, he, would, he wrote me a nice letter, and I can't find it. Man, I can't find it. That letter was amazing, that letter that he wrote for me, you know. And I gave him that letter at that job and everything. And He must really like you because he wrote you a letter. <laughs> what he does for me is he's like, go ahead and write yourself a letter and I'll sign it. <laughs> so <laughs> he's, he obviously thinks better of you than he does me. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Or maybe you could write something better than he can. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's how I look at it. Maybe you have better words or something. Yeah, maybe. So, so. I left and I would come back and I would visit Jim, you know, right. and I'd be like, hey, and he was at, he was happy to see me, man, you know. Yeah. It's not like I, I, I left and he was like, oh, I don't want to talk to you, you left me, or, you know, <laughs> he was like, man, I'm glad you're doing good, you know. He goes, one day I'll get you back. And I'm like, I, and you <laughs> never know what the future has. Right. Right? And uh, so I was escalating in this company, you know, I was escalating in this company and I was like, man. One day I'll probably be the director of this place or whatever, and then the company shut down. My heart was broken, man. Yeah. And I was like, now what am I going to do? And I started putting applications and resumes and stuff. I became a teamster, and I said, you know what? I'm not going to sit down. I'm going to keep, you know, I wasn't broke. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep doing it because what I did in my disease right. is I didn't stop. Yeah. I didn't sit down in a pity pot and say, oh, my God, I lost my job or I lost this, and I never did that. When I was out there using, I went to the next one and the next one until somebody gave me some dope right. or I found it or I hustled it. So I'm going to do the same thing in my recovery. I'm going to go and go and go until I get what I need or what I want. I'm just going to keep going. And I, and I kept going and I said, and I became a teamster and I was making some good money. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not going back to treatment. But see, God had a different plan because I put in up. Listen to this story. <laughs> listen, this is amazing. I was in my living room and I was a teamster, but it slowed down. And um, I said, you know what? I'm going to be part of Stagehand. I'm going to work both of these. And when this one's not calling me, I'll go to this one and I'll bounce back and forth. But I had put a resume with this other company. And, and, and I was like, I put the resume and they never called me, right? Mm -hmm. So that day I'm in my house and I'm putting this uh, uh, resume at this uh this place to become part of Stagehand, and Jim sends me a text. Hey, what are you doing? And I'm like, nothing. <laughs> Looking for a job. He's like, hey, I'm starting this new place. You want to come give it, you know, come check it out? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And uh, so I went, and I, I we, me and Jim didn't even interview. We, my interview was <laughs> catching up. Like, hey, how are you been? That was my interview. Yeah. It, was, it was a trip, and he was like, you know, um, and I was, and right when he sent me that text, the other company sent me. So I'm sitting in my living room with both companies, and I'm like, should I go with the company that's already open, or should I come go with the company that's opening? Yeah. You know. So when I went to Jim, I said, Jim, how do I know that this company is not going to shut down? And he said to me, I can't guarantee you that, but you're employable. Just the way that we found you in all those other places and you got those jobs everywhere else. You can go somewhere else and get another job. I took that that day and I was like, you're right. Mm -hmm. I took that. And when I walked into this company, Jim gave me a huge opportunity. And when I went there, I went to this company, I blew up. Mm -hmm. I blew up. I mean, I literally like, I went in there and he just, he didn't even tell me what to do. I said, okay, so what do you want me to do? He said, no, you figure out your schedule. And I'm like, what? He said, no. And I said, okay. So I came to him and I said, I'm going to work morning, swing, and grave because I want to learn all the shifts. Okay. I want to go to this house, this house, and this house. He said, okay. And I'm like, this guy trusts me a lot, right? <laughs> you know, and it feels good that somebody could trust you like that. Yeah. After where you came from, how are they going to trust you like that, right? Like yeah. in the back of my head as an addict, I'm thinking... How are they going to trust me? Doesn't he know who I am or where I came from? Right. And he trusted me, man. And in less than a week, 
he made me the house manager of one of the houses. And then after that, he made me the technician manager, you know, and then he left, right? He left and, um, and I was like, man, I wonder what 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 what, what can I, I you know both of you guys you know you moved on or whatever and I was like man my two my two teachers here left you know and I was like man because I would love to go in the morning my thing was to go to your office in the morning and yeah. just I didn't want to hold up your whole day right because I know that you had a lot a lot of things to do so I would try to go in there and just try to get a little bit of knowledge and and, and just see what you would give me you know, right. and you were, the, the thing about you, Nick, is that any time that's, I mean, the, the, the fire could be, you know, the, the house could be rocking and rolling and everything could be on fire and you turn around in your chair and say, well, let's look at it like this. Real <laughs> cool, calm and collective. And I'm like, how does he do that? I need that. I need that. Real yeah. cool, calm and collective. And you'll be like, this is how we're going to do it. Blum, blum, blum. And I come sometimes pissed off because of something that happened <laughs> because a lot of people think that working in treatment is real easy. Oh, well, it's just babysitting. Yeah. You're going in there to babysit. Nope. And one of the things I learned is you can't take personal when people are coming into treatment. Yes. You can't take it personal. Yeah. Those were one of the things that you told me. You said, don't take it personal. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and what, another thing you said, you know, um, there's going to be rough days and there's going to be easy days and you balance yourself out. Yeah. And when, and when you don't know something, there's this saying and you say, don't call, I think it was you or Jim that told, that told me this. If the house is not on fire, yeah. if it's not going to hit the six o'clock news or something, 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 there's another one. If it's not on fire, no one's dead and we're not going to make the news. Yeah. He said, <laughs> make a decision. <laughs> so I always use that. Like, not to this day, I always say that. Yeah. Believe it or not, when I'm, when I'm making decisions, right? Yeah. And I'm like the third person in command at this place we're at right, right now, right? And every time that I got, I, 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 my team is the biggest team. Out of yeah. everybody there, it's the biggest team, and I'm constantly hit, getting hit with everything, and you know, and this question, and that question, and this, and that. And you, not only do I have the staff, but I have the clients that are coming at me on a constant basis. And I look back, Nick, I look back, and I was like, I never thought that I would be where I am today. Right. Looking at where I came from. Yeah. You know, like... And it's a, and then this this is one of the biggest reasons I wanted to talk to you and do this interview with you because it's a it's a remarkable story, and as remarkable as your story is, your story is one of several thousand stories. There's a lot of people who have similar stories, and it's just amazing to folks like me, the non addict, right, to see this and to see this huge transformation. I can't I can't relate to it. There's nothing that I have in my personal life that's even close to relating from that transition, from going from your lowest low to where you are now. It's astonishing. What, what do you think is the biggest challenge for you in making that transition? Like, is it, are there things that today in your job that, um, that you struggle with? I mean, as far as like, I, one of the things that I think about for me that I think would be really difficult would be, you know, in the, the place, the company that you work for, that I used to work at, when people come in, they are the worst version of themselves ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are, they are sick. They're in a terrible shape. They're angry. They're frustrated. And it just becomes, you see people as they're going through withdrawal. Having been there yourself, is that difficult for you to see on a personal level? No, okay. it's not. Um, because I've seen people overdose. I've seen people sick. I've seen all, I've seen that side. Yeah. So it's not something new. Like where a person that's never seen it, is they, it, it freaks them out. Right. Somebody that goes into a seizure and stuff like that. I've seen people go into seizures and grab them and threw them in the shower when, when I was in active addiction. You have literally saved people's lives. Yeah. 
there was a time that a client overdosed. I was, I lived in, in the house, behind the house, mm -hmm. and at six o'clock in the morning, one of the clients ran to get me, <laughs> and I ran out of my boxers straight up to the client's room, and he was literally overdosing with a needle in his arm. And, you know, when you come to work in treatment, they always tell you to take the CPR class. Yeah. And I had taken the CPR class numerous of times. And I went up there, and he was blue. And it, in my head, it's like, you're not dying on my watch. Right. And he was a big guy. This guy was at least 250 pounds, and he was at least six feet tall. And look at how big I am. <laughs> you know, I'm 5'9", you know, um, 187 pounds, soaking wet, you know. <laughs> right. And, um, and I, I don't know where I got the strength, but I pulled this guy down. And I started doing compressions on his chest, and until 911 got there, and he lived, and yeah. um, it shocked me, man. That day it shocked me, and it, but because being clean and going through that, it was a different effect for me. Watching some, because every time that I did that, like put people in the showers that they were overdosing, I was high, and you, when you're high, you don't feel anything. Right. You know, it's a different feeling. I have a heart today. When yeah. I was out there, I didn't have a heart. So when I when that happened, it festered inside of me for a while. Yeah, you know, and um, the kid lived, you know, and you know, it showed me something and things that I needed to change in the house. I had to put different rules and regulations and stuff and different protocols. Uh, it taught me, you know, and, and it's a trip because um, Jim always used to tell me like there'll be times where me and Jim would do room searches. Or I'd go in and Jim would come behind me and I'd find things. Mm -hmm. And he's like, how do you know that's that, <laughs> right? Like, you know, I'm like, dude, this is a foil paper and it's been burnt, you know. And this is a light bulb and it's, you could see the burn marks and this is a spoon. Look underneath it. And he's like, how do you know that? I said, because I've been there, done that, got the T-shirt, <laughs> you know. So, and, uh, so th that working in this field not that long ago, not even like, I think I would say like three weeks ago, I was just searching a room. I just went up there just because uh, the clients like to take food in the room and I tell them not to. Yeah. And usually uh, I was just searching to see if they had food. And I glanced into the trash can and the foil, pit, it just sticks out because I'm an addict. Yeah. If I see something, I, first I seen the top of a pen. Now, if you see the top of a pen. I think nothing of it. You think nothing of it. <laughs> I mean, my, I kind of do now because of the work that I've been in, but uh, no, normally I wouldn't think anything of it. See, for me, when I see the yeah. top of a pen, that's telling me they were either smoking or snorting. Yeah. That's what it brings to me because I remember when I used to take the top of the pen off. Yeah. Then I look in the trash can and I see balled up foil paper. Now, if you look in a trash can... And you see balled up foil paper, you're like, paper. you know, you probably thought it was a Hershey's kiss that yeah. somebody threw away. Not me. I looked in the thing and I put on some gloves and I went in the trash can and I opened it up. And sure enough, they were burning pills on it, wow. you know. Yeah. And then I questioned the client, you know, and um, he lied to me. And I was, and then, see, when you lie to me, then I start, now I go into investigator mode. <laughs> and I start investigating and I go and now I start backtracking and then I repeat myself and I backtrack and I repeat myself and what happens is that you can't remember your lie and what happens is I catch you in the mix of that lie. Yeah. Didn't you just say this and now it's this? Didn't you say it was blue, now it's red, and now it's yellow? How come it changed colors every single time? Right. You know, just tell me the truth, man. I'm trying to help you is what I'm trying to do. I'm not yeah. trying to condemn you or anything. I'm trying to help you. I've been there, done that. You know, I'm just trying to help you. So those are the tools that I have that you're talking about that you don't yeah. have yeah. because I've been out in that world. The tools you have that I don't have is that you went to school. So that's why I, I look at you and I'm like, oh, man, this is free schooling. <laughs> <laughs> this is free schooling. He doesn't know it. All this time I could have been billing you. <laughs> Jim too. So, yeah, you know what I mean? Myself. That's another one. You guys would have made bank with me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but it was it, it was in our best interest to teach you things. Like mm -hmm. that that's I mean, because it made our lives easier. Yeah, so absolutely. much easier. So is it, it what do you think for the average listener who may be listening to this, who knows absolutely nothing about addiction, if there's any one thing that you wish the average person understood about addiction and about recovery, 
what do you think that, what would you want that one thing to be? One of the things that people always do, an addict is going to push the pencil, mm. right? That's mm -hmm. what we do. And us as family members, as friends, we break down. Hey, Nick, can I get five bucks? And you're like, no. Come on, Nick. I, let me get five bucks. Let me get five bucks. It's like a broken record. Let me get mm -hmm. five bucks. They're going to keep going and keep going. Every single time, you got to say no. Mm -hmm. Hey, can I, can, I, can I stay in your house? Mm -hmm. No. Hey, can I stay in your house? No. Don't break. Because as soon as you break, that addict says, I found the weakness. Right. I know. They're like looking for your button. Yeah. Yeah, let me see where I can push your button. Ah, there it is. Let me keep pushing it. Mm -hmm. If you let them do that, they're going to continue doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it works. Because right? it works. They're going to continue doing it. Me, no is no. And that's it. And my thing is, I always tell them like this. The reason I'm telling you no is not because I'm trying to be mean and I don't like you. It's because I want you to live. Mm -hmm. I want you to see what I saw. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you money. I'll buy you a burger, but I'm not going to give you any money. Mm -hmm. Listen, I told you what to do. I told you go get a job. I told you to do this. I told you to save your money. I told you to X, Y, and Z. And you're not doing it. So since you're not doing it and you keep wanting to do what you're doing, then I'm going to let you do what you're doing. I'm not going to help you because then I become the safety net. Right. Every single time that something happens, I become the safety net that they come to. Yeah. So I tell people, stop enabling them. Mm -hmm. And it hurts to, enable, to not enable your family members. In a way, it's almost kind of like... I always compared it to like a hostage situation yeah. where, you know, you, the, the addict is essentially holding the love that the family member has for them hostage, mm -hmm. you know, and it's kind of like, I'm going to kill this if you don't give me what I want. And it's hard for a family member to just have that attitude of, oh, we don't negotiate with terrorists. Right. You know, and you, you've been, you've lived through that. Right? right, because you had the exact same experience when your mom said, "No, you can't come back here." Right? Was that what was that like on the other end? What was that like for you to hear that? It hurt. I I, I had some resentments at that at that time. I was pissed. Mm -hmm. I had resentments, and I'm like, I'm going to show them. I'm mm -hmm. not afraid of the streets. Blah blah blah. This and this and that. Right? But today, thank God that they did that because now I see. Mm -hmm. I see different. Mm -hmm. Because if I would have not went through what I went through and, and been homeless and got bit by a spider, I probably would still be out there. Mm. But they had to push me out there to the fire and just say, you know what, you're going to have to figure it out on your own. Is that kind of like, you know, the, you know, in the 12 steps, one of the things that you hear a lot is the, the proverbial hitting rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Is that, was that kind of what that was like for you? Yeah. I had to hit that rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And you have to let the people hit the rock bottom. And if there's anybody out there listening and they have family members that are using drugs and they keep enabling them, they're not gonna they're they're not gonna they're not gonna hit that rock bottom. Yeah, you're you know? essentially preventing them from hitting that bottom. And that's one of the things that I've I've even said, you know, before in uh, you know, my work with individuals and with families is is really what you're doing is you're depriving that person of the catalyst that could start that change, the thing that could get them motivated to do something different. You're kind of preventing that from happening. Yeah. So, wow. What would you say is one of the most important things that you've learned going through addiction and into recovery? Like, what are some of the big life lessons, the things that you, you feel like you'll, that you're really grateful that you've learned this lesson? I've had to bump my head a couple of times. Um, at the beginning, it wasn't easy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't easy. I had to struggle. But what I always say to myself, what doesn't kill you will only make you stronger. Right. And um, I've been through some challenges, a lot of challenges. But making mistakes, see, back, back when I was making mistakes and when I was doing whatever I was doing, I always continue doing it. Mm. Today, mm -hmm. I make a mistake. I go, I back up. I think about it. I process it. And I try to, to, to do the right thing. So I don't feel that I'm like, 
really challenged in my in my life today, mm -hmm. you know, because I try to find a solution to the problem. I've got that tool where I could find the solution. Now, before I didn't have that tool where I could find solutions, you know, I just right. like, like I would get frustrated, I get pissed off, and I go use, right? I picked up a valuable tool where it's like, if 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 I if I run into a wall and I and I'm like, man, what do I do? What's going on? I ask questions. I ask people that know. Um, I'll sit back. I'll think about it. I'll have a plan A, B, or C, and then from there, then I'll execute. But I don't feel today um, I have that problem. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that I have that. Yeah, that's yeah, that's amazing. And that, I think it takes. Um, it, it's really helpful to be able to get that mindset of when things start going wrong to be able to just kind of instead of overreacting and this is kind of where you said earlier how i was very calm is because i've learned that overreacting made the situation worse absolutely like one of the worst things that you can do is overreact and then start making decisions mm -hmm. while you're emotional and then things get even worse yep sometimes just being able to sit back take a deep breath and like okay this is life trying to teach us something, right? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to, we did this thing and it went poorly. So there's some kind of lesson here we're supposed to learn. We need to adjust something and do something different. Yeah. Right. That can be very helpful. There's a, there's a group that you do. And I love this group. I saw you do this group <laughs> a long time ago. And it's, and it's, it's, it's so like kids play and all you're doing is tossing balls oh, up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're tossing balls up. And I remember the first time that we did it, right? We were tossing the balls up and you started with one and then you started with two and then we were up to like about three or four and then we kept dropping it. And then you, you told the client, what is it? You told the client that kept messing up. What is it that you're doing wrong? I'll never forget that. <laughs> we were in the courtyard and you were like, what is it that you're doing wrong? And the client was... Throwing it overhand. And right. you said, why don't we do something different? Because that's not working. Right? Why don't you throw it underhand? Right? right? Throw it underhand. Yeah. And before you knew it, we had all seven balls in the air. Yeah. Because you had to step back, give a solution, think about it, and you put it out there. And it's like, that's life. Yeah. That's exactly how life works. If you keep throwing things overhand... And you keep getting the same result, go back, <laughs> right. right, and try something different. It might not feel good, mm -hmm. but you'll get used to it in the long run. Right. Start throwing it underhand. It might just work. Yeah. You know, and those are the things that, that I've learned in my recovery. Like, you know, when something doesn't work, I don't keep doing it that way. It doesn't work. You know, that's insanity. Yeah. Doing the same things over and over, expecting different results. Yeah. It doesn't work. So I go back. And try it another way. And if it doesn't work, try it again. Yeah. Usually by... I've got a master two, two tries. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. That's better than most, I would say. So what would you... Uh, we're, we'll, we'll wrap up here in a second. But one, one question that I've got is when you're working with people in early recovery, because you're, you're not only do you do the work at the rehab, you know, where you're, you supervise a whole team of of the tax, you know, the staff, mm -hmm. but then you're also there face to face with the clients all the time. Not only are you doing that, but you also are active in NA, mm -hmm. uh, your sponsor, mm -hmm. right? What would you say is your main goal? If you were to summarize it, maybe just one or two things, working with people in early recovery, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? The first thing I have to do is I got to take care of me. Oh. Because if I can't take care of me, how am I going to take care of you or help you? So yes. something my sponsor says is you need to go to meetings and fill up your cup. Right. Fill up that sponge because you work in treatment and, and treatment is always sucking from you, always mm -hmm. taking away, always taking away. And, it, and it's real draining. So you got to go fill up. So on the weekends, on my days off, I'm going to meetings, I'm meeting with my sponsor, I'm meeting with my sponsees support group, doing stuff, fellowshipping in Narcotics Anonymous. I'm, I'm doing something in recovery to fill up and disconnecting from work, you know? Yeah. Um, so I have to fill up my sponge. So when Monday comes, I have it filled up. Now, one of the things that I do is uh, while I'm filling up my sponge, um, I don't, 
I don't overload myself. I try to have balance. I have work. I have my recovery. I have my relationship. And I have sponsees. I don't try to have a lot of sponsees mm. because I want to be able to help you. I don't want to be the person that says, oh, I got 20 sponsees and, I, and I'm really h helping two people. Right now, I only have two sponsees, right? Um, I have a couple that say that I'm their sponsor, but they're not doing the work. So <laughs> it's like I'm a sponsor by name, <laughs> right? But the ones that are doing the work, I got two of them that are doing the work. And I always start, it's like starting off with the baby. Right. In recovery, you got to remember when you start off with somebody, you can't start giving them pork chops. Right. So it's, you know, I start them off slowly and not a lot give of writing. Them the jello first. Yeah, right. not a lot of writing because you remember they come from the streets. You can't, you can't, you can't go from from bringing them on the streets to giving them a whole bunch of books to read and write and stuff like that. So um, I give them a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. Right. Um, and I start to build them up. And once they get to the next step, I give them something a little bit more. And the next step, a little bit more. Make them comfortable. I don't want to get them to the place where they're not going to want to do the work. Yeah. Because if you give them a whole bunch of stuff, that what people tend to do is that I'm like, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. But if you give them something and it's slowly, that works. Yeah. It's been working for me. So those are the things that I use. And now, when I first came in, into recovery, right, I... I didn't know how to balance it, you know. I uh, I didn't know how to, I, I had a whole bunch of service commitments. I had like seven of them. Today I only got two. You know, I take the meetings. In. Imagine this. I even take the meetings into the jails. Oh, yeah? H&I. Okay. To Clark County Detention Center. Yeah. I, I, and sometimes I walk in there, I'm like, what if they find something out that I've done a long time ago and they don't let me out, you know? That, that and, fear never leaves. Yeah, believes. yeah. So, but you know what? Like I said, God had a plan for me, man. And now I'm 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 in there taking it taking the meetings in. I was at a meeting the other day and um this guy was like, Hey, you remember me? And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I don't. He said, You're you're the guy that takes the meetings into the jails, man. And you were telling me about these meetings out here and stuff, and you told me where to look. And look, I'm here, man, and I got ninety days clean and I was like, Wow. That, that right yeah. there is my high. That's what gets my passion to, you know, to keep going. That's where that fire that you hear yeah. comes from. To hear somebody say, hey, remember what you did? This is where I'm at today. You yeah. know? That's so an amazing that's, feeling. So that's how I balance it out. I do service. I meet with my sponsor. I do step work. I do step work with my sponsees, you know, um, and I go to meetings. You know, on a, on a constant basis. And when I don't do that, it just feels like something's empty right here. I don't know what it is, but mm. something's missing. And I start snapping at my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm edgy at work. So I'm like, I need to go to a meeting. I could feel it right here. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. And that's very important. Everybody who works in this, in this line of work, self-care is so important. And when you're not taking care of yourself, uh, it makes a difference. Yeah, it has a huge impact. Absolutely. So it's kind of like one of the things that they say, you know, I've heard this before at meetings where they'll say, like what they say on the airplane, you know, make sure you put on your mask first before you assist somebody else. Yeah, and, and that's true. Sure, yeah, make sure that you got, that you're stable. That's true, man. Um, today, man, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful where I'm at today, you know. I'm, I'm so grateful that, that I've been given a chance and that, you know, I would never look at myself, and, and, and I look at myself today, you know, I got a good girlfriend, uh, I got a good job, you know, I drive my own car with my own license, my own insurance, it's not, you know, fictitious plates and all that, like, you know, because I used to drive cars with fictitious plates and, and drive somebody else's car, and you know, and not have insurance, right. and, and today it's like, everything that I do is legal, you yeah. know, I do everything by the book. I make sure my license is right. Those are things that a normal person be like, that's what you're supposed to do, right? <laughs> but we, we're, we're, but us addicts, we're like, that's not what we do. Right. So when, when an addict goes, oh, I got my license. Normies look at them like, and? So what? Like, you're supposed to get a license. For us, it's a big deal because of the fact that we've been messing up so much, yeah. right? Remember at the beginning of your story, you said yeah. 15 years yeah. of doing anything? You couldn't find it for us to get our license, to get a bank account, to pay the rent, 
to just have a job, right? Yeah. It makes it such a big deal for us to get a year clean, right? Yeah. To get nine months, you know, for a normal person, they're like, why can't, why couldn't you just do it, you know? Well, and, and all of those are landmarks. They're all things that are indicators that you are making progress. And I know for a lot of the folks that I've worked with in the past, they're all things, and they may seem small to, to most people, but to a lot of people who've been to that rock bottom, there are things that they never thought they would have. You know, even being able to say, you know, like, I went out and bu- I bought new clothes, you know, brand new clothes. They're not secondhand. They're not a thrift store. Like, new clothes. I'm the only one that's ever owned them. Right. You know, it's like, and you see, like, this is, that's a sign that they're making progress, and it's something that they never thought they could do. Yeah. So, pretty amazing. Yeah. I, um, I, uh, it... I've done the same thing, you know, and now it's like I own two cars yeah. and one of them is parked. I don't even drive the other one, <laughs> right? I've had it for so long and it's parked, but I look at myself and I'm like, I got two cars yeah. and they're not stolen. They're yeah. mine. Yeah. You know, the car I got right now, I'm like, man, I put a nice stereo in it. I bought some rims. I didn't steal <laughs> the rims. I didn't steal the tires. I literally had the money and I bought it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was like, man. I bought it. This is all my stuff that I bought. And, 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 you know, those are the things, Nick, those are the things that I'm not just boasting about it. I want, I want the recovering addict that starts off yeah. to see, like, you can have these things, too. It's just not about the material stuff. It's how I feel. Yeah. Because I don't, live, I don't live in a big house, and I don't drive a big car. I have a little Toyota truck, a 2011 Toyota truck. But I'm so happy because I don't have to walk to work. And it yeah. runs good. It doesn't break down. I live in a, a nice, uh, with my girlfriend, in a one-bedroom uh, um, condo. But I could go to my house, lay on my bed, open my refrigerator, and that's, I'm happy with that. But you know what? It's the, it's the happiness that I got here in my right. heart. It's not even the material stuff, you know? I got money saved up, and it's not even about the money. It's how I feel. And wherever I go, I take that with me. Remember I told you that I would go, I went from L.A. to Vegas to Florida, yeah. right? And my disease jumped in the suitcase with me. Yeah. Well, I got to go wherever I go, and I'm okay with myself today that I can go anywhere I need to go, and I know that I'm not going to pick up yeah. because I have a foundation. I have, I have tools today that's not going to... Say, you know what, that weed smells pretty good. Why don't you go try it? Mm. See, Mm -hmm. I play the tape all the way through because your disease, your disease only shows you the good part. Right. And then it pauses. (laughs) It pauses and you got to be the one as an addict, you got to take it off pause and let tape play all the way through for you to remember what happens at the end. Yeah. And I play my tape all the way through and I'm like... I'm going to lose everything I got. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my girl. I'm going to lose this. I'm going to lose that. It's not worth it. I put too much work into all of this. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good spot to end. Thank you. This was, and I I, I was really excited. Like I've got three interviews lined up. This is the one I was really excited about. Thank you. (laughs) I'm making you feel good. (laughs) Because you've got an amazing story and you've worked really hard to get where you're at. And it's very, it's very inspiring. I think a lot of people can, even people who aren't addicts or alcoholics can can take something from this. So absolutely, thank you very much. You're for welcome. Me. All right, awesome, cool. Okay, so there you have it. My interview with Junior. Uh, I hope you guys had as much fun listening to it as I did recording it. Um, he's a great guy to talk to. We could have talked for hours, but he's also a very busy dude. So we definitely appreciate his time. And uh, who knows, maybe, uh, maybe we'll have him on the show again sometime. I hope so. That's all the time we've got for this week's episode. We want to thank our landlords, the Ice Cream Social Podcast, and thanks to all those of you who contribute to the show. We really appreciate it. Remember, pod therapy isn't something you should keep all to yourself. Help us reach others by opening this episode's description in your podcast app and copying and pasting the link provided into your social media. Don't forget, you can find us on Facebook.com slash pod therapy, on Twitter at pod therapy guys, and now on Patreon.com slash therapy. Do you want to submit your own questions to the show? Ask anonymously at www.podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. I'm Nick Tangeman. Thanks, and we'll see you for your appointment next week. Mm-hmm.